Welcome to this afternoon edition of Theological Journals. We start this way. If the Lord be for us, who, pray tell, can be against us? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We turn to the Westminster Magazine for news. Faith in the Public Square's 2020 Conference Christian Christian an American failures and faithfulness of our fathers will occur Friday, March 18, at Bay Presbyterian Church in Bonita Springs, Florida. And the people are asking today what it means to be a Christian in America, especially in light of the country's history with slavery and racism. Have our founders left a legacy of faithfulness or failure? At this year's Faith in the Public Square Conference, we will explore those questions. Speakers include Peter Lilbeck and Harry Reid, the first, third. Join Christian, join us for Christians in America, the failures and faithfulness. For more information, please visit. It looks like you need an invite, event bright invitation. Secondly, Westminster Theological Seminary, in conjunction with the Center for Science and Culture, is pleased to announce Westminster Conference on Science and Faith, which will occur in April. At this important conference, scientists and theologians will meet to explore this year's theme, Design and Designer, Convergence of Science and Theology. Speakers will feature Vern Poitras, Scott Oliphant, Stephen Meyer, Aaron Metaxas, and others. The conference will occur April 1 and 2 at Covenant Field Fellowship, Glen Mills, Pennsylvania. Number three, Westminster's 93rd commencement. Ceremony will occur May 26 on Westminster's campus. All, the next is the 16th annual Gaffin Lecture will occur on March 23, 2222. Dr. Daniel Strange, director for Crosslands Forum, a center for cultural engagement and missional innovation, will give a lecture on Electix Redux. Rediscovering a Lost Theological Discipline. A lecture will be hosted in person on Westminster's campus as well as live streamed. The Center, another announcement, the Center for the Study of the Westminster Standards recently made three new appointments. Dr. Todd Rester, Calvin Seminary, will serve as the Craig Center's curator to undertake the collection and collation of pertinent printed and manuscript materials refer, uh, referring to or regarding the Westminster Assembly, its members, their writings, and reception of their work. Nathan Knockley, PhD student, Westminster Seminary, will serve as Craig Center's assistant director carrying out research-related activities on Westminster Assembly, supporting the director and curator in the acquisition of relevant scholarly materials, and for forming, formulating project plans according to the stipulations of the director for the center. This is three new appointments, Todd Rester, Nathan Knockley. Nathan will also oversee student research, foster relationships with like-minded research centers, and organize seminars and conferences. Dr. John Bauer, MD, THM, will serve as the chair of the advisory board. John will not only provide unique insight and guidance for the expanding staff, but will also help establish principles for practices and outlines for strategic planning. So they've got a curator, an assistant director, not sure who the director is. 
The Craig Seminar is a f the next announcement, a formal academic seminar funded by Craig Center. These seminars afford scholars the opportunity to present papers that relate to the theology, history, and philosophy of the Reformation and post-Reformation periods. The seminaries, seminars occur the last Thursday of each month of each semester or the 2021-22 Academic Center at 4.30 p.m. in the Craig Room of the Montgomery Library. For information, visit events page on wm.wts.edu. We will do some checking around on that. We now turn to modern reformation and we are continuing the article it's an interview actually with dr tom rott principal of evangelical theological college in ethiopia and he's given him some of the history of ethiopic christianity which was coptic greek orthodox as an Islamist population and then Protestant missions have also made inroads. So we pick up here with his answer. We're continuing the article. Though Islam historically came very early to Ethiopia, attempting to make it an Islamic nation by Turkish and Egyptian Muslims, Ethiopia never converted to Islam. There was a time when northern Ethiopia almost became a Muslim nation as a result of the brutal Islamic invasion under Gergagna Mohammed. The Ethiopian Empire appealed to Europeans for help as it was the only Christian nation in Africa at the time. In the 16th century, the Roman Catholic Portuguese responded with military force to curb Islam's spread. That's the only thing they understood and understand. Together with the Ethiopians to defeat these militant Islamist imperialist forces. As a kind of thank you gesture, the emperor of Ethiopia became a Roman Catholic. This was a turning point. This caused a civil war between the Orthodox and the Roman Catholics, taking thousands of lives of Ethiopians. When another emperor came, there was a theological debate about the two natures of Christ. They had a history of monophysitic Christi uh, Christology and confirmed that Ethiopia would stay on the Orthodox, na an Orthodox nation. This further cemented the historical relationship between the Orthodox Church and the national identity of Ethiopia. During the European Reformation, Ethiopia closed itself off from the outside world since foreign influence in theology had led to civil religious wars previously. We were ignorant about the Reformation. This is this doctor talking when it was happening. For 200 years, the continued, this continued until the modern missionary movement in the 18th and 19th centuries. It was during this time that the Ethiopian church began developing some dangerous elements in its theology. Salvation by works, the worship of angels, the veneration of Mary and the saints. What had a very good beginning with good apostolic history became twisted. The modern missionary movement began in Ethiopia in the 19th century. The teaching of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church was identified as distorted, far from teaching the truth, so Protestant missionaries came to bring reformation, revitalization to the Ethiopian church in the north. The church was open and the missionaries helped with the translation of the Bible into the vernacular language. 
but the missionaries repeated the same mistake from the past, not learning why Ethiopians had expelled Roman Catholics, the sensitive theological issue of the nature of Christ. There was a head-on collision with the clergy of the Ethiopian church on the doctrine of two natures. They also started attacking the veneration of Mary, so the Orthodox Church expelled missionaries from the northern part of Ethiopia. By God's providence, the missionaries came to southern Ethiopia, where there was a high concentration of pagans and animists. They received the gospel and established Protestant evangelical churches. In Ethiopia today, there is a clear demarcation between the north, which is highly orthodox, and evangelicals in the south. And we will resume that. It will take us a couple days, and then we will do, have an article by Charles Cotherman rethinking how we think about the evangelical mind in the local church. We look forward to that. Now for Westminster Theological Journal with Dr. Kogley's um, engagement with Berkovich, a scholar, Dr. Berkovich, and his thesis that the New England Puritans claimed or arrogated to themselves the title of New Israelites. And Dr. Kogley is dismantling or disavowing that. The word pick up here, the word type and anti-type, moreover, permeate the New England sources. Yet the closest any American Puritan came to declaring that the colonists were anti-types of the ancient Israelites occurred in 1730, when Thomas Prince stated in his centennial sermon that we, though in lower degree, are particular antitypes of that primitive people. The New Englanders had vocabulary to say exactly what Berkovich claimed they said, and yet with the partial exception of Prince, they never said it. Berkovich quoted Prince, leaving out the lower degree qualifier, and an especially troublesome one for him, given his reigning assumption that antitypes were superior, not inferior, to types. Otherwise, he could document his case for the Puritans' self-identification as the antitypical chosen people only by modifying the content of the original sources. Take, for example, his alteration of three passages from Increase Mather's pen. First, Mather wrote that the troubles preceding the destruction of the Jewish church and state may be applied to the troubles of the last time, the former being a type of the latter. Berkovich claimed that Mather located these anti-typical calamities in New England during the so-called declension, the region's perceived decline in piety in the late 17th century. Mather, however, explained in this passage that the calamities in question were conflicts with the coming battle of Armageddon. Second, Mather said of Isaiah 44, verse 3, I will pour my spirit upon thy seed. We'll have an anti-typical and more glorious accomplishment. Berkovich said that Mather identified this anti-typical accomplishment as covenant renewal in New England. Mather, in fact, saw it as redemption of the actual Jews through the spirit of the converting grace of God. Third, Matthew specified the visible church, not our visible church, as the antitype of to the Jerusalem temple. And we got a few more days on this before we move to Matthew Payne. Matthew Payne is a doctoral student at the University of Sydney in, of 
Sydney in Sydney, Australia. And his work is on William Perkins. That's coming up. The Doctrines of Faith and Assurance Through the Lens of Early Faculty Theology. We move on to Mid-America Journal, thankfully, with a new article by J. Mark Beach. I'm not sh Let me just check and see who he is. The title of the article is Still No Peaking, Karl Barth's Contest with Federal Theology. Uh, give me a second. It doesn't tell us here. We'd like to know who the man is. We don't know where J. Mark Beach is from, but still no peaking. Karl Barth's contest with federal theology. It is well known that Karl Barth's theology represents a revised paradigm on standard confessional reform consensus regarding how to conceive of God's posture towards human beings, both in our present state of fallenness under rescue in Christ Jesus and in the original paradisal situation as narrated in the early chapters of Genesis. This revised paradigm is not always fully grasped by defenders of confessional reformed orthodoxy and the theology often intended with it, reformed federal theology. While Barth's Christocentric shift is well noted, its implications are not well perceived. Many counter criticisms against Barth's censure of traditional reform thought fail to plumb the depth of the Swiss writer's critique of typical Christian thinking vis-a-vis -vis God in himself and therefore God in relation to his creatures. In many ways, besides his revised doctrine of election, Bart's critique of federal theology exposes this paradigm shift, which reaches down into the Godhead and God's fundamental relation to our posture to, toward his creation, specifically as centered in human creatures. Footnote 2, select secondary literature on federal theology includes Gerhard as Voss, Richard B. Gaffin, uh, John Murray in Covenant Theology, Wilhelm von Eschelt, J. March Beach, Christ in the Covenant, Francis Turretin's Federal Theology, The Doctrine of Grace, published in Gottingen. So he's a doctor, that's for sure. We wish to analyze and assess Bart's critique of federal theology with the aim of examining the implications of that critique for a biblical message, indeed the gospel itself, which means we must also weigh the strengths and weaknesses of Bart's approach to the gospel. It's got a long list in footnotes of relevant secondary literature. The whole page is nearly footnotes. We'll pick this up. Or for this purpose, I will present Bart's analysis of federal thinking, along with his stringent criticisms against it. This will be followed by an extended synoptic analysis of Bart's criticism with the aim of clarifying his censure of the federal approach and understanding the gospel. This section will also include my assessment of Bart's opposition to federal theology under multiple topics. In conclusion, I will offer some summary remarks regarding how the paradigm of grace and federal theology contests Bart's paradigm and how each view cannot escape looking through a glass dimly. What follows is intended to engage Bart as a theological review. Sounds fascinating since he captured the 
Presbyterians for a while. We move on to Anglican and Episcopal history and the story of Thomas Cole and his paintings. We still have some pages to go, so we press forward. He was an Episcopal vestryman who was an artist. In further commemoration of Cole's death, Thomas Cole's death in 1848, William Cullen Bryant, his friend and associate who'd written a sonnet to Cole, the painter on his departure for Europe in 1826, penned for Cole his funeral oration, which was delivered at the large Unitarian Congregationalist Church of the Messiah located on Broadway near Waverly Place in New York City. Their friendship subsequently depicted in a Catskill setting by a painter, Ash, Asher Durand, in his composition of Kindred Spirits, which was for long displayed on the third floor of the New York Public Library. In the Metropolitan Museum, there is a bust of coal taken from a cast of his face at death by Henry Kirk Brown. And the fourth highest peak in the Catskills is said to be named Thomas Cole Mountain. <clears throat> Cole's infusion of high moral and didactic purpose into his writings, The Voyage of Life, was especially noted and obviously appreciated by such persons as Bryant and others. And of the 83 works by Cole shown in the memorial exhibition a few months after his death, the most celebrating paintings were his allegorical ones, The Course of an Empire, The Voyage of Life, and The Cross and the World. Already in 1848, before his death, Convinced of the educational and ethical importance of such paintings, especially the voyage of life. And that was a very interesting set of pictures from birth down a river to youth, down a widening and more turbulent river of adulthood, down to at the elderly, which the river then goes off into the ocean of eternity. Cole had urged, as he put it, the works of purity and excellence must be cheapened and multiplied in a way to reach every class in the community. Cole had encouraged the possibility that his voyage of life should be multiplied by distribution and sale of sets of engravings at a price which could be within the reach of multitudes of households across the country. The person who implemented this was James David Smilly, 1807 to 1885, a professional engraver of banknotes from Edinburgh, who had settled in New York City in 1829, and who was known to have produced engravings for the works of such painters as Asher Durr and John Frederick Cusett, Jasper Francis Crosby, Crosby, Albert Bierstadt, and Cole himself. We'll pick that up. The art story tomorrow. As we turn to the Churchman and Donald West's article on the cry from the cross of Jesus in Mark 15, 40, 30. Mark 15, 34, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The second response to Jesus' death is the centurion's declaration that this man surely was the word of God. Verse 39, this declaration brings the purpose of the Markan narrative to a climax since the, fir this, since the centurion is the first human character 
to identify Jesus as God's son marks key title for Jesus. It is no accident that the person who makes the declaration is almost certainly a Gentile. Within the gospel story, such a purpose, person represents those who, although excluded by strictly applied temple regulations or dismissed by Jewish religious leaders, finds divine salvation and healing through confessing their faith in Christ, several Markham references. Perhaps the most astonishing thing about the centurion's declaration is that he applies the elevated title, Son of God, to the crucified, now dead, Jesus of Nazareth. In contrast to the first set of responses, the second set is positive towards Jesus' suffering and death being divinely initiated and evidencing effective change. To sum up our analysis, we have seen that in Mark 15, 34, Jesus cries out for help to God as he endures judgment for sin. Number two, his cry is a plea for God to be present with him and not absent from him. And as he suffers, the responses to Jesus' cry contrast his rejection by those who test him with the identification as the Son of God by a Gentile centurion. It is now time to step back from a detailed analysis and consider the meaning of Jesus' cry for a help us prayer and whether and how this prayer was heard by God. Interpretation, number three, the meaning of Jesus' cry from the cross in Mark 15, 34 has taken three main paths in recent interpretation. The first view sees Jesus' calling out for God through his suffering. This view has roots in the mystical tradition of prayer in which Jesus' cry provides the means and example for his followers to enter God's presence themselves through ultimate self-sacrifice. This interpretation regards Jesus' cry as a prayer, but the purpose of the prayer does not seem to fit with the tone of Jesus' cry, Why have you forsaken me? Jesus' cry does not arise from someone seeking deeper harmony with the divine being through giving up self, but from someone facing an experience more awful than death. We will resume that tomorrow. As we turn to the Protestant Theological Journal, and the article on the only letter that Calvin sent to Luther, he sent it via Melanchthon. I'm not sure it finally reached Luther. It was written in 1545. And it's Calvin's query of Luther on behalf of the French Reformed churchmen who were struggling in France as persecuted people. Some were willing to come out, confess the Bible faith, and face persecution and even death. Other French Reformed believers said, wait a minute, why suffer? Just believe what you believe quietly. And the French authorities require you go to the papist false church and you can listen to that and think through the service in your French Reformed way. Calvin's not happy with that answer, and he's and there's confusion among Frenchmen who seek Calvin's advice. He gives his advice, which is pretty stern in my estimation, uh, broadly speaking. And now Calvin is asking Luther, what say you? Calvin informs Luther that after he sent these two tracts to the French Protestants, their response in France was mixed. 
Some refused Calvin's words immediately. Others were at first stirred up to stand for their confession and show themselves openly as Protestants. Over time, however, many of these did not persevere. Now they have written to Calvin to ask Calvin to ask Luther to give his opinion on the matter. In doing so, Calvin believes the French are looking to find a pretext for yielding. In the letter, Calvin asks Luther to read his two anti nicodemite writings and give his own opinion on the issue. They were called Nicodemites, that is, they would come to Jesus by night, but by Sunday morning would be back in the papist church. And this is a, uh, an article done by a Protestant reform minister. The letter from Calvin to Luther reveals the importance Calvin placed on the believer's worship. In his work on the necessity of reforming the church, Calvin declared that right worship was the great reason for the Reformation. Even subordinating justification by faith alone to this chief motive, in worship, one publicly makes known who one is. In worship, one fulfills his highest duty to God. For Calvin, to conceal who one is is bad enough. But then for a true believer to pretend to be the opposite, an idolater was inconceivable. For the French... Pro Protestants to avoid persecution, they were required not merely to keep to themselves, but co positively to confess they were something they were not. We need some documentation here, son. There, though their hearts were purportedly not in this idolatrous worship, Calvin said there must be union between heart and outward confession. Those who disagreed with Calvin appealed to Nicodemus, who was converted, but continued on as part of the Sanhedrin until making an open show of faith later. Calvin's requirement to them was too severe. For this, Calvin called them Nicodemites, entitled one of his two tracts, Answer of John Calvin to the Nicodemite gentleman concerning their complaint that he is too severe. Nicodemus was wrong in Calvin's view, and so were they. But this was not merely Calvin's view of the matter. There was agreement among the reformers with Calvin on this point. True inward and outward were imperative for the believer. We'll pick this story up again tomorrow as we move on to the Reformed Theological Journal and a new article by Dr. Craig Carter, Metaphysic. The title is The Metaphysics and the Interpreter of Scripture, a reply to Daniel Trier. In the last issue, Dan Trier responded to my book, interpreting scripture with the great tradition. I thank him for doing so, and I wish to offer a few thoughts in response so as to continue what I think is an important conversation about the importance of certain metaphysical commitments for the true interpretation of scripture. I hope this isn't going to get wonky. At the outset of his paper, Trier says that he is not sure if one can maintain both the Protestant primacy of the literal sense and the hermeneutical pertinence of a classically Christian theological ontology, close quote. He concludes the paper with a hopeful yes, but with the significant qualification that such an ontology can embrace aspects of Christian Platonism without insisting on its general or comprehensive necessity, close quote. 
this conclusion reflects the general tenor of the entire paper in which a certain vagueness is allowed to persist as to the exact metaphysical propositions we should and should not embrace and also the exact relationship of these metaphysical propositions to biblical exegesis. This vagueness is not unique to Trier. Rather, it is endemic today in confessional, Protestant, and evangelical theology. The, classical Christ, uh, the crucial question is how classical theism and the classical metaphysics upon which it relates, relates to the Bible. It is actually a question of whether or not the classical Trinitarian and Christological orthodoxy of the creedal tradition, including metaphysical doctrines such as simplicity, immutability, eternity, and aseity express the true teaching of Scripture. If we wish to affirm the classical doctrine of God, to what extent are we then obligated to hold to the metaphysical principles and doctrines on which it rests, such as act and potency, causation and realism? Since, as everyone knows, the Bible does not contain the technical vocabulary of Aristotelian Thomist metaphysics, the question naturally arises as to how one could claim biblical support for doctrines such as divine simplicity, which rests on the concept of God as pure act, actus purusimus, as Thomas would say. This problem is not restricted to issues related to classical theism. It extends to the central confession of the Trinity itself. The Bible does not contain the term Trinity as used in the Nicene Creed, nor for that matter the categories of person and nature as used in the definition of Chalcedon. The Westminster Confession of Faith and other Reformation confessions teach divine simplicity, which is not comprehensible apart from certain classical categories such as actuality and potentiality. The Orthodox creeds and confessions have always made use of extra-biblical categories terms and concepts in stating the teaching of scripture. But in our post-metaphysical age of ideology, this sort of thing is frowned upon by cultural forces. We'll pick that up tomorrow, tonight. Well, we are with Dr. Patrick Schreiner. He's working his way through Acts, the three-part approach of Acts, the gospel in Jerusalem, the gospel in Samaria, and it's widening, and now in the third part, the gospel to the nations, as Prof. Schreiner does a nice job of working his way through the book of Acts in an overview, macro perspectival perspective. Now we're on to Macedonian Philippi, and Acts 16. Philippi is also a significant place Paul visits because he establishes new messianic households under the thumb of the Roman Empire. Philippi was a Roman colony with many retired Roman soldiers. Although Paul has visited other Roman colonies, this city is highlighted for its close connection to Rome. The emphasis on the Roman nature of this episode is evident by Luke's word choices. Colony is used only here and is itself a Latin loan word, Acts 16.12. The chief officials are called strategoi, a Greek term which is, stands for Roman praetors. The police are the rabdukoi which are Roman lictors, 1635. 
finally, Paul and Silas speak of themselves as Roman citizens. This shows Paul, uh, Luke's very sensitivity to these technical terms. These details are not merely to add local color. The narrative is concerned with the mission's penetration into the Ro Roman world. Philippi is Rome in microcosm. In Philippi, two household baptisms are mentioned, Lydia and the jailer and his whole house. This is the first time since Cornelius mentions, that, or that Luke mentions the baptism of households, which shows the success of the mission in Philippi. Lydia becomes a central figure who hosts Paul and his companion, the jailer, and his household is con converted. And they did that as family units, which is hard to understand among American individualism. Individualists, they still do it in Italy. The whole family comes. Kids, all ages. I saw that a couple of times while living over there. They wouldn't come over to the Protestant evangelical Reformed faith. They came as a group. A rich woman and a worker of the state are welcomed. Rome valued the order of households as a microcosm of the state. Luke shows new messianic households are sprouting in the midst of a Roman colony. <clears throat> if in Philippi, Paul confronted Roman customs and in L Lystra challenged pagan rustic practices, then in Athens, he clashes with the intellectual elites. Look, Acts 17, 16 to 34. Luke presents Paul as a philosopher grounded in the logic of Hebrew scriptures as he announces a more universal message to a sophisticated crowd. Though many universal, universalize the Athens speech, making it the training ground for every type of apologetic situation to a non-Christian crowd, the scene in Athens presses into the particular. The philosophic crowd are integral to the narrative. Even though, and I've been down at that area where that all happened just off the uh, Ath, uh, Agora, the ancient uh, merchant area, which is all has been excavated, and then that's just slightly down on Mars Hill from the Parthenon, where the philosophers hung out, asked hard questions. Even though Athens was not at its prime, it was still the center of Greek philosophy because of its associations with Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Luke makes sure make sure that readers do not miss this point by his mention of the Agora, the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, pagan shrines in the Areopagus. Paul addresses Athens at their basic assumptions and deploys philosophical language to stake out common ground. Though Paul is labeled an amateur philosopher, Acts 17, 18, he makes Yahweh known to them through Jesus Christ. Rather than explicitly employing Old Testament scriptures to prove Jesus as the Messiah, as he does at other times and in other locales and does with significant ease, Paul speaks to them in the philosophic language of the day. He quotes their own poets and alludes to their traditions. However, he does so in order to transform their worldview. The speech is essentially a call to repentance, not a search and find game of commonalities. Nice turn there, Prof. Very, very nice not a search and find game for commonalities. We'll pick that up tomorrow as we turn to uh, Princeton Theological Review of 1837, the days when you got theology, unlike what we'll see a little bit later with a recent journal. 
some of the giddy intrusions there. Anyways, this is uh, Paul Henry's Life of Calvin. It's an extended book review of all sorts by James Waddle Alexander, son of Archibald Alexander. Uh, this is his son who dies, what, 1858 or so, dies very young, 51, 52, 53. He's an ordained Presbyterian clergy. His, his dad had died in 1851, I think. Very close to, he dies very close to his father. Both of them are buried up in the Princeton Seminary in the family plot there. Anyways, the son is reviewing this French biography. Henry is a French biographer of Calvin. And Mr. Henry, the biographer, is a pastor of a French Reformed church in Berlin. And the book is written in 1835, and it may be one of the best biographies that I've ever seen on John Calvin. And it shows, and Jane Waddle is, seems to be, it, either it's a translation or a reiteration. It's, it's a long, long book review, page upon page, but it's wonderful. Well, we're now talking about uh, uh, John Calvin's marital prospects. There's been two candidates on view, and finally he will settle down to Italette de Bure, the widow of a French Anabaptist. The period of their earthly union, re, union was only nine years. On comparing Italette de Bure with Catherine von Bora, the wife of Luther, we perceive the former to have had the preeminency in rank and accomplishment, referring to Calvin's wife. The sentiments of Calvin on this matter are, are apparent from a letter to Farrell, quote, call to mind what my expectations are concerning a wife. I do not belong to the insane lovers who dote on the very faults of one whose person has captivated them. I shall find the only beauty which attracts me if she is modest, docile, exempt from pride, frugal, patient, and likely to have care for my health, close quote. After the fashion of the times, he chose to have the wedding as festive as was consistent with moderation and accordingly invited to it the consistories of Nucatel and Valenciennes. These consistories sent deputies. As to the character of his wife, we have his own testimony, and he seldom indulged in eulogy or used superfluity of language, that she was singularis exempli femina, an exemplary feminine, singular per, singular exemplar as of woman. By her former marriage, she had several children. By the second one, one son by Calvin, who soon died after birth. Catholic writers have dwelt with an unfeeling severity on the fruit, unfruitfulness of this union. Thus, the Jesuit Briatus says, quote, he married Italette, by whom he had no issue, lest the life of so infamous a man should be propagated, closed quote. The falsehood of the allegation is shown by many authentic witnesses. Draylen Court, after fashion, mentioning a repetition by Papyrus Masso, Jacques de May, Florimond de Raymond of the assertion that, quote, although Italette was young and beautiful, these nuptials were condemned to perpetual sterility, close quote. Adds, quote, but M. de Bees, B. B. Biza, says in his life of Calvin, he had a son who died immediately after his birth. And Calvin says the same in his reply to Baden, close quote. The words of Calvin last referring to are truly touching. 
and evinced the dignified moderation which usually characterized his replies. Quote, Bowden, says he, abrades me as childless. God gave me a little son. He took him away, close quote. Bowden accounts it an opprobrium that I have no children, but I have myriads of children throughout the Christian world. In many of the letters of Calvin to his friends, he mentions his wife and communicates her salutations. Few of these admit of citation in the isolated sentences we do have. And we'll stop it. We should insert them, would be divested of the charm of their incidental connection. In a very warm and affectionate relationship is the upshot of where this article is going. Bring that to an end. We turn now to the Concordia Theological Review and the argument by Dr. Foy advancing the need for Lutheran confessionalism at the university level, Lutheran universities. Theological commitments simply bear the weight of the university's everyday activities without any visible effect on their character. The nature of the commitments is irrelevant so long as the footings support the deck. However, the relationship between theological commitments and a university's everyday activities is much more complex. To cite just one example, atheistic, materialistic commitments support an entirely different understanding of the human being than do Christian theological commitments. And our understanding of justice cannot be easily separated from our understanding of the human being. Lutheran University's vocation to the church and to Christian students thus requires them to articulate how the faith informs a variety of important public issues. That in turn requires the Lutheran universities to maintain a substantive public confession. In fact, as Ernest Simmons has observed, our culture is one within which intelligent corporate reflection on religious e issues is neither prevalent nor welcome. A Lutheran university can and should model for its students how to engage in intelligent reflection on such questions. And it should draw students into such reflection and train them to engage with it. Very nice turn, professor. We concur as confessional Presbyterians and prayer book people. And it, O.P. Kretzman writes, having rooted its educational approach to historic Christianity, the essential task of instruction is to establish the relevance of Christian knowledge to all areas of human knowledge and life. Ba-boom. The method of doing this may vary from course to course, but the objective is always the same. The instructor in chemistry may do it one way, the professor of history in another way, and the teacher of English in still another way. A Lutheran university with substantive theological commitments is in a unique position to show the relevance of the Christian faith in this way. First, it has a solid set core of commitments to the Christian faith. It is important that the university, as it reflects on the implication of that faith for students' various vocations. Secondly, because Lutherans believe the Holy Spirit works through the word of God to bring faith in Christ, Lutheran universities can admit non-Christian students in obedience to Christ's command to make disciples of all nations without requiring students to convert. That's interesting. 
Finally, because Lutherans believe that the nation stations of the left hand of the kingdom are common to all, Lutheran colleges can admit non-Christian students without requiring a faith statement of any kind. Having non-Christian students opens the door to true dialogue about Christian questions. The existence of such conversations does not call into question the core commitments of the university. Instead, faculty can represent the university's core commitments without that conversation. We'll pick that up in our next session as we turn now to the silly little third year boy who's, I say that because he's talking about serious doctrine of God with Aquinas and classical theism and he's going to get into Hagel and yet he so rudely and violently intrudes in a, in a quiet footnote that he's going to call God. He's going to shift around the terms he, she, it, they. And there's another one. So be prepared to hear God called all kinds of gender terms. Next thing you'll know, be calling God a queer and a homo and a sodomite. This is coming out of Princeton Theological Journal a year back. He's offended me already in all the techno mumbo jumbo. So here we go for a little reflection on God. The act of God's intellect, he tells us, God being who God is as truth becomes the measure of every other being and intellect that is not God. This is how Aquinas makes the move from God, primarily knowing herself, to also knowing her creation. I don't, this is ob obnoxious. Thomas, th he's a third year student at Princeton. Thomas thinks that there are two ways in which a thing can be known in itself and in another. God knows that which is not in God in this second way. And another more specifically through knowing God's self because all things have an essential relation to God and so depend for their essence on God by her simple act of knowing herself. This guy's name is Eric Tuttle. I think I've met him up there. He's a postulant for Episcopal playing games. He's out of an evangelical free background is my understanding. This is just a different perspective on the same concept from the previous paragraph. And again, because God simply is her knowledge, she is simply truth itself. I, I'm having a hard time getting past this. Hagel and God's simple knowledge. Here we go on Hagel. One of the smaller arguments running throughout this paper is that Hagel actually helps us better articulate classical idea of God's simple knowledge with all of its political implications. For disagreement, perhaps the best place to begin Hegel's version of God's simple knowledge is his discussion of God's simplicity and pre-Kantian metaphysics in his science of logic. For Hegel, classical metaphysics was better than crit the critical philosophy of Kant, which he, which bade man go and feed on mere husks and chaff. <laughs> Says nothing that could be truly known at all. Yeah, bye bye Kant. Nevertheless, the notion that things can be known through direct apprehension without the mediation of one's own subjectivity is equally problematic for Hegel. Yet such direct apprehensions rely on categories or finite forms, which Aquinas calls concepts. Yet, and by the way, interjecting here, we have to read this stuff so we know what's going on. We can stay at top uh, developments in the theological world. <clears throat> so, a lot of it's good. A lot, so we got some bad stuff too. As old Princetonians, we don't run from a fight. We stand and fight. 
To think of God in terms of simplicity, then, is problematic for Hegel. If simplicity is understood as a positive term or as a predicate. And we'll bring this boy to a fast and happy close. As we turn to uh, this bizarre article in Themelios from last fall, Navigating Empathy, by Jonathan Worthington, which has turned out to be a somewhat of a circus with a flavor of the Wild West. And even he titles his next section Ramming Speed. It's on sympathy, empathy, compassion, and there's apparently conflicts. Not my era of specialty. Onlookers know a ship's crew character. The title is Ramming Speed when definitions collide. And I've been in two situations at sea where our ship nearly collided. It was in the Straits of Gibraltar, a heavily traveled uh, strait, all oh, manner of shipping going in and out. Onlookers know a ship's character, crew, and mission by its standard ally or enemy, country, military, or trade vessel. Regarding empathy, it seems one ship is flying the banner, empathy, while crewed by, by understanding others from their vantage and feel, feeling something of their emotions. But another ship is flying the banner, empathy, while crewed by enmeshment, losing your identity, extreme relativism, losing truth. Those are two different ships. As we prepare to navigate the basics of empathy, remember how in the introduction I use sympathy for passages not using sympathes, word group, and empathy to gloss a passage that actually uses the Greek word sympatheo. This was a flag to flag a fundamental but multifaceted issue, understanding how to navigate the clashing definitions. What does sympathes and empathia mean in the New Testament era? Is it okay for meanings of words and symbols to morph over 2,000 years? What does the English term and English word sympathy mean today? Are all definitions created equal? Can multiple definitions of empathy or sympathy conflict yet as to be legitimate? If two conflicting definitions are used widely, how can one be thought illegitimate? Below, I demonstrate the banner empathy does have a certain meaning and its ship and crew are on a certain mission. Others have been stealing on board and promoting a thoroughly different and damaging agenda under the beautiful banner. And to criticize the banner by looking at the mutineers is to move the discussion in an unhelpful direction. A similar dynamic is taking place with the term sympathy. This is not the focus of this article, but a brief glimpse is illustrative. In an animated video with over 16.5 million views, exclamation point, Brene Brown criticizes sympathy in order to commend empathy. See what it says, conflicting definitions and where in the world is this going? This is an evangelical-type publication. So what is empathy, she asks, and how is it very different from sympathy? For Brown and some others in popular opinion, sympathy is calloused, lighthearted, with no real care for the person in pain. Most scholars, however, treat sympathy either as an aspect of empathy as empathic emotion, or at least closely related to sympathy. That's how I see it. But very different, not by any stretch. 
One of Brown's missteps is not differentiating between some popular assumptions about sympathy on the one hand and research, parsed, analyzed, tested, peer-reviewed, careful definitions of sympathy. She merely assumes the former and criticizes sympathy per se. Some do the same thing with empathy. Thus, we will navigate academic research on empathy and popular uses of it for divergent definitions of empathy are reaching ramming speed. We'll call that to a close and this session to a close. Remembering St. Paul, if God be for us, who can be against us? Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.